Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Could you state your name for the record, please? My name is Diane Scala Barnett, hyphenated. And where are you employed? I am employed at the Lucas County Coroner's Office in Toledo here. How long have you been employed there? Since 1985. What's your current job title? Um, before I was um, a deputy coroner, and now I am the coroner since 2018. Um, what's your educational background? Basically, in a nutshell, it's um, four years of college, a year of graduate school, four years of medical school, um, a year of graduate school, and then four years of residency. Um, and then a year of fellowship training. And then I finally was able to work. <laughs> finished. And, and when that was finished, that took us up to 1984 when you started at the Lucas yes, County Coroners? That was uh, the end of my fellowship year was 84. Okay. Uh, doctor, I'm going to approach and show you state's exhibits uh, 191 through 200. I'd like you to just take a quick look at them. Prior to coming into the courtroom, did you have a opportunity to review uh, these exhibits? Yes. Okay. Uh, just generally speaking, uh, what's the source of these exhibits? Basically speaking, these are the uh, these exhibits represent our everyday, customary duties at the coroner's office. Did all of these exhibits come from the records of the Lucas County Coroner's Office? Yes. And are they kept in the ordinary course of business? Yes. Thank you. Uh, doctor, I'd like to review some of these records uh, with you. Uh, specifically, I would like to talk about, start with 191. What sort of record are we seeing here in 191? You're looking at um, what is called a case summary or a front sheet. Of an autopsy protocol. Who's the uh, decedent in this case? Um, Mr. James Petaway. Okay. Now, I'll direct your attention to the uh, bottom of the record. Uh, who performed the examination on Mr. Petaway? It says multiple pulmonary complications. Well, I I'm sorry. To the, I'll direct your attention to the very bottom of the form here. Who is oh. it that performed that examination? That's signed by me. Okay. And um, at this point, were you the uh, coroner or were you still a deputy? I was still the chief deputy okay. when I did this autopsy. Now, Dr. Barnett, um, with respect to uh, Mr. Petaway, uh, were there any anatomic diagnoses made? Yes. And what were those? Um, he had multiple pulmonary complications of a drug overdose. Um, we had to test what drugs were in a system, so that took six, eight weeks. And finally, um, in February, we got those results back, and I had finished my autopsy, so it was ruled then. Um, the multiple pulmonary complications included a necrotizing bronchial pneumonia. What does that mean? That's a very bad pneumonia, usually starts from aspiration or when you're on a ventilator. He was on a ventilator because of his overdose. And what does necrotizing mean? It means that infection is so bad that the tissue is actually dead. Um, and you find pus and inflammation and um, dangerous things to be around, I should say, because it's very contagious. Uh, Dr. Barnett, um, you said that the autopsy was not finalized until the February 
uh, after the death, is that correct? Right, because we have to wait for toxicology results. Okay, but uh, at the time of the autopsy, were you able to make those anatomic diagnoses? Yes, I didn't need the tox for that. Okay. That's a gross diagnosis. And uh, I'll direct your attention to the top of the form. What was the date of the uh, examination? Uh, I examined Mr. Petaway on the 3rd of December of 18. And he died on the 30th of November. Okay. Dodger, next I'll direct your attention to State's Exhibit 192. What sort of uh, form is this? Um, this piece of paper is what the funeral homes generally give us. It's an authorization from the family that says, yes, coroner's office, you can release Mr. Petaway to such and such a funeral home. And what date uh, was this? Uh, that was date? on December 5th. Next, I'll show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 193. I'll turn it so that we can read it. What sort of form is this? This is our morgue record. And basically, it's the form that starts your chain of custody of the body. So in other words, St. Vincent's had the body. He died there. He came to us. Our livery service at the time was Greg, Hay, uh, Mr. Haybager, and he picks up the body, he signs for it. He delivers the body to us. And um, the person who removes the body from us has to sign on the other side of the morgue record. That maintains the chain of custody of the body. So the left side is incoming to the coroner's office, the right side is, is outgoing. outgoing. Correct. And when, uh, in 193, uh, as to decedent Mr. James Petaway, uh, what was the outgoing time from the coroner's office, date and time? He was picked up at 12, 5, 18 at 2.24 p.m. Next, we'll look at uh, 194. What sort of form is this? Um, well, Mr. Petaway left, but Mr. Petaway had to come back. And uh, when did Mr. Petaway come back? He came back on 12-6 at 2.35 p.m. All right. And uh, when did, did Mr. Petaway's body leave the county coroner's office again? Um, I believe it was several days later, 12, 11, 18, and that was 11 o'clock in the morning. Taking a look at uh, 195, what sort of form is shown here? This is the same um, form authorization for release that the family signs gives to us. It says, okay, now you need to release the body to House of Day Funeral Home. And what was the date that this form was filled out? This, was, this form was signed on the 7th of December of 18. Now, Dr. Barnett, um, were you familiar with the circumstances that led to uh, Mr. Petaway uh, leaving the coroner's office and then returning? What are the circumstances surrounding that? Yes, are you That's personally... That's an unusual circumstance. We don't usually get patients back once they leave for the funeral home, but in this case, um, we had discovered that Mr. Petaway didn't actually go to a funeral home. Okay. Um, I'm going to direct your attention to December 6th of 2018. Uh, on that date, did you travel to 4112 Airport Highway? I did. Right. And was that regarding the body of James Petaway? Yes. Um, went into this building, which is, was in the back of a strip mall. And what did you see when you got there? Um, I remember that the building, sort of an outbuilding, was uh, octagonal, like shaped, like round. And when you went inside, it looked like uh, a storage room for, for party, um, maybe party chairs, party tables. There was some wicker furniture in there, I remember. 
um, and the body was actually laying on one of the collapsible party tables. Like you put an additional table for a picnic, that's what it looked like. Um, when you observed uh, the state of the body and the room that it was being kept in, did you have any concerns? Well, first of all, um, this room was not refrigerated. This body should have been under refrigeration, just like it was when it left our place. Uh, we keep our coolers at 39 degrees. Uh, that's the minimal of what this body should have been stored at. And the reason being is because we already talked about the necrotizing pneumonia. That is contagious. That needs to be kept refrigerated to lessen the decomposition. There's so much, so many germs growing in that pneumonia that it easily gets into the bloodstream. It's called sepsis. This is easily acquired um, like community acquired pneumonia. If you are um, exposed to this body and you don't have personal protection equipment on, it could pose a health hazard to the person in there. Uh, when you observed a dangerous uh, situation, the coroner's describing there. We're hitting the pause button. We're going to hear more testimony from her again. She's the lead coroner there in Lucas County where this case is being tried. Thank you for being with us here on Court TV Live. But by Whisker. This defendant would brazenly represent himself as a funeral director. The defendant didn't own any funeral home. The families needed to get the person buried. And that's what he was doing. He would return the cremated remains. There was a shortage of urns. The state of the body was such, it was so decomposed that the worker got violently ill. What's the advantage to Mr. Hart of having bodies in his possession not disposed of? None. Oh, this case is not an easy one. The defendant being defended by his legal team on innocence grounds, the state saying that he broke several laws. On the stand right now, we have the lead coroner in Lucas County, Ohio, that encompasses the city of Toledo. Her name is Dr. Diane Scala Barnett, and we hit the pause button uh, where she was talking about how dangerous it can be if, if a person's body uh, becomes septic and the person handling the body isn't wearing the proper protective equipment and encounters the body. Uh, she's talking about the health risks uh, that can happen. Let's watch. Uh, when you observed the um, the condition of Mr. Petaway's uh, body and the body bag, did you see anything that concerned you? I did. Um, I found out later <coughs> that when they were removing the bag from the cooler onto the transport pot that the bag ripped about six inches. Uh, our employee at that time was named Dion. She didn't feel that at that point we should reseal the bag. Um, or put it in an, a second bag because it was right by the seam and it was small. Um, when I saw the bag in the room, the rip was more like this, almost a couple of feet. Um, I think that probably happened somewhere in the transportation. And you could see there was um, staining on the zipper seam. So there was leakage, we know that. It had stained the zipper and that was right next to the big rip now. When you say leakage, what do you mean? Well, you have to remember this body has been autopsied. It has not been sewed up. It has not been embalmed. So you have body fluids leaking into the bag. That's common. That's why 
deceased persons get em embalmed so quickly after death, if it's possible. Uh, Doctor, when uh, Mr. Petaway's body was brought back to the county coroner's office, uh, what happened to it? Well, I directed that actually. Um, he needed to come back and be put into a, a cooler again because it was exposed. Uh, there was leakage, you could see that. And um, we have this big tear in the bag now. So I took repossession of the body and put it uh, back in our cooler. Doctor, uh, moving on from Mr. Petaway, let's uh, address a few more documents. I'm going to direct your attention to State's Exhibit 196. Uh, what's shown here, generally speaking? This is a note that I uh, believe Dion, several notes, that Dion um, sent to the in, one of the investigators who was looking into um, this case and she actually is just keeping him abreast of the changes that were going on was this and the phone calls that were happening. Uh, was this communication preserved in the records of the county coroner's yes, office? Yes, it's in the chart. And uh, 197, uh, again, generally, what's here on pages one and two? Yes, same thing. Um, these are requested release forms. Uh, let's move on to three. We'll move on to page five of exhibit 197. What sort of form is this? This is a statement attesting to death. Um, I actually just learned about this because I've never had to sign one yet. So, uh, an attestation of death means you're not going along the usual lines through a funeral home, <clears throat> but you need somebody to, to attest to the death. You need somebody to be certified that the person is dead. The only people that can do that is the coroner or the medical examiner. And uh, so the statement attesting to death, um, in, in what circumstances would this be requested? Um, this, this form is required by the Department of Health if you haven't gone through the normal funeral home pathway. Uh, the normal funeral home pathway, would that be the funeral home using the EDRS yes. system? Um, when a funeral home has to get a death certificate, and we generate the death certificate, they have to um, put the case, the funeral home puts the case into EDRS. Then we... The coroner's office goes into EDRS, pulls up the name, and then we can put in a cause of death, manner of death, and it's electronically signed. Not everybody has access to EDRS. You have to be registered, uh, usually an MD or DO, or uh, the, the, the physician in the hospital has access to it. Um, doctor, uh, prior to coming to court, did you have an opportunity to review the coroner's file uh, for Mr. Petaway? I, yes. Uh, in your review of the coroner's file for Mr. Petaway, uh, did you find a form uh, like this, a statement attesting to death? Yes. Okay. Uh, 198. What sort of documents are shown here? This was another name I found in Mr. Petaway's file. Different name, different person, but it's still on these um, attestation forms. 
Uh, so that meant somebody was asking for a, attesting the death of these two other individuals, um, just like Mr. Petaway's. Doctor, you just testified as to the um, attestation of death forms for Mr. Petaway, and now uh, Mr. Wood has asked you about the form for Mr. Hall. Uh, as the elected coroner for Lucas County, you're familiar with the laws, health regulations, vital statistics regulations, all those, um, the Board of Funeral Directors and Embalmers regulations? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, is there anything illegal about um, someone who is not a licensed funeral director um, in supplying information regarding the death of a decedent for inclusion in EDRS by some other entity? Not to my knowledge is it illegal, but it's the only way you're going to get a death certificate is to do this form. You're just not going through the usual hoops. You're not jumping through the usual hoops with a funeral home. So in that situation, when you're not using a funeral home, you're not going through the usual hoops to get into EDRS to, to generate a, an eventual death certificate. How is the information verified, if at all, um, when the statement of attestation of death You have to have somebody comes? put it in the EDRS or you, you'll never get a death certificate. How does the person putting it in EDRS know that that information is verified? The, well, in our case, we have all the documents and if you're asking for help, from somebody to put it into EDRS, they shouldn't be doing that because they don't know all the facts on that particular body. Could a family member complete the statement of attestation of death? Uh, um, to my knowledge, it's a physician from a hospital, a coroner, or a medical examiner. And how would that coroner, physician, etc., get the underlying information? Well, they can get a, that that particular like time of death and et cetera can come from the family if they know it or from the hospital. And if but you have, a, you have to have a fact gatherer. Okay, and anybody anybody could be that fact gatherer. Is that correct? Well, yes, because you're not you're not asking someone for their funeral home license. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Sorry, Mr. Wood. All right, with a little break in the action there after his honor's questioning, we are going to squeeze in a break because we're at the bottom of the hour. Don't go anywhere. More Court TV Live after this. 790-0793. This is Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. Thanks for being with us on this Tuesday. Let's go back to court together now. We're in the phony funeral home trial in Ohio. We're still in the state's case, this one being prosecuted by the Ohio Attorney General's office. On the stand right now, a woman who is the lead coroner in Lucas County, which encompasses Toledo. And uh, the prosecutor was just kind of looking at his notes and taking a pause where we left off. Let's see what he has left in his direct examination. So, Doctor, uh, am I understanding this correctly, that the uh, statement attesting to death and the checklist for registration of death without funeral home, uh, that they would be in part filled out by a uh, fact gatherer and in part filled out by the coroner's office with information that the coroner possessed? The um, fact gatherer or the representative for the family has to come to our office and get the coroner to sign this attestation. Otherwise, there's nobody to say he's legally dead. So the fact gatherer brings the information to the coroner's office and requests the sign off from uh, the coroner. The fact gatherer requests an attestation 
of death, a certificate or a paper or whatever. Okay, and then they would take that certificate, that attestation, uh, and combine it with the registration of death, and then what would they do with that? They still have to find somebody to put it in EDRS. Okay. Do you know if uh, an employee at the Bureau of Vital Statistics is authorized to do that? I don't know that. Okay. Let's take a look at 199. Um, again, briefly, uh, what sort of document is this? It's the same. It's a release authorization for Mr. Um, Leo Hall and from our office. 200. What sort of document is this? And this is um, this is on letterhead from Celebration of Life. Um, does, does this also relate to Mr. Leo Hall? Yes. Okay. Similar to the ones we saw on the other people. And again, all of these documents that we've reviewed kept in the ordinary course of business at the Lucas County Coroner's Office. Yes. One more, please. Thank you. If I may, uh, Doctor, at least in Lucas County, where you're the elected coroner, are you aware of any uh, registration requirements for a person, entity, business, etc., to transport a dead human body either to the coroner's office or away from the coroner's office? Um, I, I know that the funeral homes and we, our livery services, all come under the contract of that funeral home under the auspices of that funeral home they're not delivering people or picking up people willy-nilly they have to be a representative well in the case of for instance mr petaway what there you're not claiming there was anything illegal about uh, a livery service or some other person or entity picking up the body of Mr. Petaway once they produced to you what appeared to be a valid release form, are you? That's correct. I was concerned about the environmental conditions of the body and where they were placed. I really was not involved in this part of it in the sense that uh, finally Dion came to me and said, Dr. Burnett, something's wrong. I don't think this body is going to a funeral home. I said, what? And but it then, need not go to a funeral home. Pardon? Apparently he did not get so. What? But, but my question was, it did not have to go to a funeral home upon its release from your office. Fine, if I'm but you people. can't leave an unembalmed health hazard in an unprotected area, um, a common room. Very well. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Wood, I perhaps ask questions you'd like to follow up on, but maybe Mr. Kerger can go first with his cross. Dr. Rick Kerger, we met some years ago over in federal court. Oh. Uh, enjoyed the experience then. Question. You've specified all this concern about the environmental hazard Mr. Petaway caused, correct? When the body was picked up, the only people who knew about the environmental concerns were people in your office. When the body was picked up from that room? From the coroner's office. No, I, I communicated that um, concern to the police department. No, no, no. I'm talking about the person picking up the body. The one who's going to be handling it and handing it in his truck. Did anybody tell him there was a health hazard? Uh, sir, we don't share the 
dead person's information with a livery service. Even though he's at risk, according to your testimony. Well, he should be wearing PPE if he's coming uh, across dead Wait. bodies. You never know what the body has, do you? Well, you do. Is I there do, but I'm not, I'm not out at the back dock releasing bodies. Is there any reason you couldn't tell the people who are releasing the body, help him understand there's a health hazard? You don't have to get into details. Anybody that's dead in a condition that's not conformed for dead bodies is a health hazard. What do you mean in a condition not conformed for dead bodies? No refrigeration, no running water. The temperature was 50 degrees. He was about? already starting to decompose, sir, because of his <clears throat> bad infection. Well, I'm, I'm he was going to continue to decompose because he wasn't in a refrigerator. And the bag is leaking. I think we covered all that. And the bag was leaking because it had gotten torn in the coroner's office and no new bag was in, put in place. And it was torn by the livery service, not us. Doctor, you said, I thought, that when you saw the tear, it was maybe six inches. Correct. And that when was when I, when I read about the tear, I wasn't in the back. When I Some, read about the tear, Dion said it was about six inches and it was near the scene. When I saw the bag, it was much, much bigger than that. And it is not hard to imagine that... Oh, we're going to hit the pause button on this cross. Uh, we're a little behind the, on the video, so I can tell you that uh, it gets quite contentious as it progresses. We're going to hit a break now. When we come back, we'll get you back into the courtroom in Toledo. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Back to court we go. And we're seeing the start of what will be a very contentious cross-examination of the lead coroner in Lucas County. Let's watch. And it is not hard to imagine that a tear can get enlarged as it travels. True? That's correct. And that's why the bag should have been replaced in your office. True? The body bag? Yes. I... I I would agree with you on that. I think it should have been at least taped or sealed. Particularly when it contains a body that's infected. That's correct. It contains a body that's infected, and the person picking it up doesn't know that. Sir, a lot of people that pick up bodies don't even wear gloves. So, you know, that's not my problem. You just if the body, if the livery service, they know what they, they can expect from dead bodies. They've been doing it for a long time. They should wear gloves. They should know what they're coming in contact with. They're signed up to be livery services. Do they all do that? Do they all wear gloves? Yes. My Detective people certainly Bully. do. I'm not talking about the coroner's office. I'm talking about the livery service. Most of the livery services that I have seen removing deceased persons wear gloves. And would that have protected the individual from the air coming out of the bag containing the infection? The bag should not be open unless it's damaged like this one was because there's a zipper sealing it. So there is air coming out from that rip that would correct. be hazardous. Even more important that that body be left to in refrigeration. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, doctor. I'm asking questions for a particular answer. And I answered them. Well, I'll try another avenue. Mr. Harden had asked that a livery service from Mansfield pick up the body and take it to Akron. Did you know that? No. His plan was a, a being taken to a funeral home in Akron. And Scotty Rogers came in. Scotty Rogers is a cousin of the decedent and changed the plan. Did you know that? I don't need to know that, sir. Mr. Harden had no knowledge on that date 
of your coroner's results, did he? I, they weren't published yet. Well, I thought you said you don't publish results of the autopsy. I said I did the autopsy. They're not published legally until the tox is back. So Mr. Harden couldn't know on that date the condition and danger that body created. I've already stated any dead person that has died can lose or lose body fluids. You don't know what that person has. You have to take um, you have to take medical precautions. Well, that's, that's just, you got a body who's been embalmed. Is that no longer a threat? Not nearly the threat as if they're not embalmed. Should we tell people going to an open casket that they should wear protective clothing? They're embalmed. And that's what makes save the problem. Yes. Do you have any evidence that Sean Harden directed the delivery of that body to the airport highway address? It's not my concern, sir. Who delivers it? Who picks it up? The answer to my question is no. Are you answering your own question? I'm trying to get an answer to the question. Then repeat the question. Could you read it back, please, Karen? Question, do you have any evidence that Sean Harden directed the delivery of that body to the airport highway address? No. Did you discuss with Dion Shante Harden? Dion came to me several while this was going on, and um, she relayed some concerns she had about the celebration of life chapel. She said, um, to me, I don't think this sounds right. I think there's something going on. Now, you have to remember, Dion has been in our office 10 some years by that time. You get to know the funeral homes, you get to know the livery services, and this particular situation was not in sync like usual. Doctor, do you go to those Monday night dinners with the funeral directors like Dion does? Um, I went to a few of them, not all of them. Have drinks and dinner? Pardon? Have drinks and dinner? Dr. Patrick went to those meetings. He was still the coroner then. Have you gone since you became coroner? Yes. And you hang out with the funeral directors from the Northwest Ohio I don't area? hang out with the funeral directors, sir. I don't know what that implies, but I don't hang out with them. Well, you talk in friendly ways with them at these dinners. When I, when I go to the dinner and we share information. And Shante Harden was a topic of conversations at those dinners, was he not? Well, not at the dinners that I attended. Fair enough. Now, you got concerned about Mr. Petaway laying in that building. <clears throat> so concerned you went there. Yes. And you didn't tell your coroner pickup person to go down and pick up the body and take it back to the office until the next day. I don't remember the times and dates, but our livery system, the one we contract with, took the body back. On December 6th. The All right, day this is just a hunch, but it's my guess this is not the first time that that coroner and that defense attorney have faced off as adversaries in a court of law.